Let's pray together. Father, thank you again for this series of meetings that you have allowed us to be a part of, just to function in your kingdom. In even the most, what would appear to be to men, as Pastor Bill said in the earlier session, insignificant in the earth, because men tend to value things like that which is highly esteemed among men, but in the sight of God is abomination. So let us operate in your kingdom. Yes, Lord. So today, sir, we will do so and enjoy what you're doing among us. We're looking forward to what you have to say in this next session. Amen. Lord, I am, I am particularly impressed to read the scripture here that you penned so many years ago where you said, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. So we thank you for this writing you. and for this session in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Hubert Pruitt sits here in front of you. That's me. <laughs> That's him. I'm going to tell you this. In the years to come, you're going to look back and you're going to tell people, oh, yes. I was in a church service with Hubert Pruitt, and people will marvel at what you had to say about him. Amen. He's not just one that's, you're, I don't call him typical, no Christian is typical, but I can tell you this. This man right here has been, what did Paul say, has been a succorer or a helper. He has been a defender of your pastor. I've known him better part of 30 years, more than 30 years, and I'll tell you this about him. He uh, was a counselor. He was a man of wisdom. He was one that everybody went to. When he walked into a room, everybody thought he was in charge because in the realm of the Spirit, he was in charge. And people read that in the atmosphere in a moment had they never even been in his presence or ever met him. He's been involved in, in uh, um, criminal justice and the criminal justice system. He's been involved in the political end of, at the state level, high level in, in our politics in the state of Georgia. He's pastored churches. He's run businesses. He's been in missions. He is absolutely what I would call an apostolic utility player. And today he's moved forward in things in the realm of the Spirit in that he's not only an instructor in the body of Christ, he is a father in the faith. Please welcome this very stately man of God. This is Hubert Pruitt. Well, I thought I was going to speak today. <laughs> oh, all that uh, introduction. I'm speechless. No, you can't walk. It won't last long. <laughs> oh, praise God. You know, he said something that I've, I've had trouble understanding of all my, especially my Christian life. I don't really remember a whole lot about my, my worldly life. I try to forget all of it. And I asked the Lord to help me to uh, determine. Uh, I asked the Lord to help me forget my language when I got saved. I, I could outcuss most sailors, and I had a good teacher, Buck Rutherford, and, and I started working for him when I was 12 years old. I, I applied for Social Security a few years back, and the um, lady said, when did you start work? <laughs> I said, when I was 12 years old. Started paying taxes when I was 12 years old. Don't regret it. Paying taxes in the greatest nation that's ever been under the face of the earth. Amen. I don't try to cheat on taxes. I'll, sometimes I forget stuff, and I probably could do a whole lot better job with, uh, with my paperwork. But one thing I've, I've always tried to do is, is, is be fair. Uh, the Lord told me to walk in newness of life when I got saved. 1966, I went in a Baptist church in Mountain View, uh, up in Gainesville, Georgia, Mountain Baptist Church, Mountain View Baptist Church, I believe it was. Ford Skinner was a pastor, a Baptist preacher, just a far boy. I mean, he was a good preacher. I loved him. But I, I wasn't saved. And uh, 
I went there one morning and they had, a, uh, it used to be the times when they called the whole church down to pray. You know, those days, any y'all old enough to remember that? We just all come to the, I went to the church in the core congregation, Holiness Church for several years and we had the choir and everybody in the congregation went to the choir. Well, nobody left out and I'd seen to. I never did understand that. I just went along with the program. I just went up there and sung with them, you know. But anyway, I, I, went to, I went to that altar that morning when he called everybody down to pray, and I just knelt down like everybody else was doing, you know. I blend in. I, I, was, I was an actor. I could do anything, even when I was lost. I do more now when I'm, since I'm saved. But, but anyway, I, I just went down with everybody else, and the preacher come up and laid his hand on my shoulder. I, I feel it today, John. I still feel that. He, he said, Butcher, are you saved? I said, I couldn't lie to him. I do a lot of things I wouldn't lie to a preacher. I said, no. He said, would you want to be saved? I said, I really do. We'd like to be saved. And we prayed a sinner's prayer. I was on my knees, and he was on his knees, and I, I was just I was just lost it. And, uh, but I asked the Lord to come into my heart. I come into that church that morning, uh, going south, left, going north. <laughs> A new creation in Jesus Christ. These people that don't miss a lick on their chewing gum when they get saved, I ain't got much confidence in their salvation. I'm sorry. I, I'm not their judge. I'm not judging them, but I just don't, I don't have a lot of confidence. You know, there's people you know you got confidence in. And there's some people you know you ain't got no confidence in. You don't have to tell everybody that, right. but you just, uh, you just, just, the Lord just says, just hide that in your heart. But the Lord touched me. I was drinking a fifth of alcohol a day. These people talk about drinking, you know. The, the 22. Started when I was about 13, drinking, smoking. And uh, walked out of that church into my memory. Now, I'm saying, you notice what I said. The best I can remember, I never took another drink. Never smoked another cigarette. Now, some secondhand smoke, if that counts, I've been smoking a lot. <laughs> but that, that shouldn't count. Uh, but I uh, had a checkup here a while back. Yeah, I've had some physical problems, but I'm still in pretty good shape. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people woke up dead. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I met an old preacher one time in World War II, and he, 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 he got shot. They thought he was dead. He, they threw him out in a pile of dead soldiers. He said, when I woke up, he said, I like to froze to death. <laughs> but they, he, 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 they realized he was alive, and they pulled him in there and bandaged him up, and he lived to 80-something years old. So uh, no matter what it looks like. But anyway, what I'm trying to tell you is that I died to sin, you know, and, and I hadn't lived a perfect life, but I've tried to live a life that, that would be pleasing to the Lord. Try to help people. Try to encourage people. I still haven't got victory over uh, getting upset when they don't listen to me. Uh, these people that I've helped finances, you know, I, I, they listen to me. I make you some money, but I get aggravated when they won't listen. Now I don't charge them nothing for it. If I charge them a thousand dollars, you, Mr. Rainey, or some of these other people, you know, I, I might get more people to listen to me. But uh, it, it, I, I, it's just amazing why people. They say they want to change. They say they want to do better but they don't do better. Now there's a fellow walked in the road in this church just now that, 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 that's, that's to touched my heart in the last few years. That's Sawyer, uh, Benjamin Sawyer Walker. He's my great, he's my grandson, two years old. Going down the road yesterday, he said, Paul Paul bulldozer. You know, a bulldozer on the side of the road. He, I, I, who told him I was a bulldozer? I, he, he, he scares me. I leave, my, I leave my cane sitting in the house. We have the privilege, I count the privilege of taking care of him in the afternoons that, that he goes to morning, mother's mornings out till, till one o'clock and three days a week he does that. Then we keep him the other two days while his mother's a school teacher in, in Lithia. But I have my cane and sitting over here, go pick up that cane. I said, Papa's cane, he'll bring it to me. You know, so he thinks I need it. But anyway, I've been blessed with two great grandkids, praise God. Blessed with a wonderful wife of 53 years. Wow. And same woman now. Yeah. A lot of people have been married all their life, but they had two or three different wives. <laughs> that don't count. But anyway, the Lord's been good to me. Married that lady. She fell in love with me before I fell in love with her, but 
uh, I met her and started going to church with her and got saved. That's what you, that's what you get by hanging around with the right people. I've <laughs> <laughs> got several things I want to share with you today, and I, I don't know exactly how. I'm like the pastor this morning, the preacher this morning, just there's so, so much to say. It's a, uh, it was a good word. Y'all were here. You enjoyed it. It was a good word. Good word. Amen. Praise God. He bothered me when he said Second Timothy, though. I, was, I said, Lord, now you're sure you didn't give the same message to the same preacher. <laughs> but when he said chapter what's two, chapter two, That's chapter one, I said, well, I'm all right. Yeah. <laughs> Timothy is a big book. It's got a lot to say in it. Not a, not a big book in volume, but there's a lot in it. A lot of big, heavy stuff in it. A lot of stuff in it. And as we started thinking about the uh, course or the theme of the series, Stay the Course, uh, you go a long ways with that. Uh, I'm reminded of a story that came out during World War II. Uh, there's a battleship going down the canal and uh, a big light come up in front of it and Admiral Nimitz got on the phone or on the on the speaker or on the microphone and said, "This is a battleship, a hundred-ton battleship. I'm Admiral Nimitz. I command you to turn left. We're coming through, full speed ahead." <coughs> Guy come back and says, "Well, sir, I'm 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 in the Navy and I'm just starting out." But he says, this is a two-mile island, and I'm on a lighthouse, and I can't move. If you don't want me picking you up off the shore, you better turn left. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, full speed ahead and uh, stay the course is, is wonderful, if you go in the right direction. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, don't take, an, don't take a brain surgeon or a... Uh, or a, a great engineer to realize if something's not working, change course. If I, I fish Lake Lanier with a friend of mine, Hoyt Morgan, we, he passed away uh, a year or so back, and we fished for 30 years. Last of March, 1st of April, we are at Lake Lanier. Well, we loved it so much, we bought a place up there, bought a house up there just so we'd have a place to park our boat and stay as long as we wanted to and didn't have to pay no rent. Just $2,000 a year taxes. <laughs> so it's amazing what you get what you, when you, what you want, how you get it in it. Right. Yeah. Amen. Uh, but anyway, we fished. But you know what? We learned something. I learned something real quick. He taught me a lot about bass fishing. Uh, he, he taught me that if they ain't biting, move. Don't stay there. But if they bite and stay there. <laughs> But if you're going up the river real fast and uh, you know there's a pile of rocks over there and that water is 10 foot low, you better change course. You, they're going to be picking you up off the reef. And sometimes a foot underwater, sometimes the rocks are two feet high. So it's just always according to the depth of the water. So full speed ahead was another saying that come out during World War II. One guy says, Turn the torpedoes full speed ahead. You know, no, no, just, just don't, 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 don't let the torpedoes bother you. And uh, that works a lot of times. People have great sayings. We, uh, we was talking about uh, Benghazi, uh, the, the, uh, our embassy that was just, uh, attacked and people killed and radio announcements come out and went over the air and said, we need help, we need help, and we help, and it was just, just nobody paid no attention to it. And it, it's good that we didn't have people like uh, Patton and uh, MacArthur and people that dared to challenge things and put a stop to it. They just said, we wouldn't allow that. They, they'd stopped it. We got, we got Marine SEALs. If, they, if they'd have got that call, it, it wouldn't took them very long to be there. Matter of fact, the thing about it, what people don't understand, we had people close by. Yeah. They could have been there in a little while. Yeah. I can go to Atlanta, Georgia, and get on a 747 and be in Lima, Peru in six hours. That's 4,000 miles away. Yeah. And we got stealths that can fly faster than you can even think about. 
and they got we got bombs that don't even need a need a, a pilot, or need an airplane. They do it with a drone. People sitting in, in California can run a, a drone that's in uh, Saudi Arabia with a bomb on it. Don't need no pilots. So we, I mean, we got we got people that could stop things if they know about it. Let's read. We got this book. This preacher used so much scripture this morning. I, 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 there was times I could, could do that. <laughs> but it's those wonderful words. You know, yes. just, just like this. You walk in newness of life. You know, he talks about being a new creation, creation, born again. I mean, you know, I found myself loving the things I used to hate and hating the things I used to love. Wasn't that yeah. something? I used to love bright lights and uh, dark lights and dance floors and loud music. Now I can't stand some of that stuff. You know, it's amazing how you change. Yeah. Age don't have nothing to do with what happened to your heart. Yeah. See? So stay the course. If if you got something that's working, you remember what the preacher's fixing to tell you. If you got something that's working, don't change it. I work, but we talked about Bert Clendenin at lunch today, and I worked with him for several years, and moved to Texas, and uh, worked real close. Close by, we we were close. We were close. I, he's gone on to be with the Lord. I miss him. I think about him uh, every week. I think about Bert Clendenin, the things that we went through, and the stories we could tell. Man, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man, I won't even try to tell you some of those. <laughs> but we love God. He was he was a godly man. He taught me a lot. I, I had I, I, I cherish that as, as well as a Bible school. We talked scripture. We read scripture. He'd come to my house when he was in Georgia, and uh, we'd talk till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning sometime just about the goodness of God and then things was happening. And I'd go, to his, I'd go to Beaumont and stay in his house, and we'd talk. And uh, I'd, I wouldn't want to get in the bed to get to sleep. He'd be knocking on the door, Preacher, come on, let's go. Got to go to the hospital. You want to be a pastor? Come on, let's go. I've told that to people. I said, well, I, they tell me they want, they want me to train them, do some training. I said, okay. I said, next time I get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'll call you and we'll go to the right. hospital. Didn't get no takers. <laughs> 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 but he, he, was, he was a good man and he, he taught me a lot. And I learned, I've learned, I've learned. Uh, back when I was in school, I didn't, I didn't care nothing about school. I couldn't wait to get out of school to go to work. Uh, but after I got saved, I had this insatiable desire to study and to read to pick up and, and do, to get my education in better shape than it was in. And, and the Lord helped me with that. Uh, gave me a job that where I could uh, read blueprints and talk to architects and talk to builders and millionaires and billionaires and, and not, not, you know, sit down, don't matter who I talked to, I just carry on a conversation with them. Didn't bother me. Didn't bother me one bit. I could walk, I could walk into to Kroger today or we can go to, we can go to uh, uh, Walmart I remember I'd be walking down the aisle. Somebody come up and ask me, where's the beans at? Where's the green beans? I said, I think they're right over there. I went to Jimmy Swaggart meeting in Atlanta many years ago. I walked in, just standing there. My mom, I ain't said nothing to nobody. No badge on, no nothing, just standing there. A lady, a man come up, come up uh, sir, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm late. I just couldn't get here no quicker. Where, where'd I go? I said, you see that guy back there with a the badge on? I'd go back and ask him, he'll tell you where you're supposed to be. I didn't tell him I wasn't part of it. <laughs> I didn't want to bust his bubble and make him apologize. I just sent him somebody else, you know. Uh, it's just amazing. You, you, you walk, I mean, just, 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 yeah. just God demands, I don't know why he does that, to, but he can just, just put something on you that people want to come be around you. That's just a God thing. And you have to be a God thing to understand a God thing. But my old pappy used to say this, son, hey, write this down if you don't know it. You should know it. And yeah, you probably don't, but you, you should know it. Son, if it's not broke, don't <laughs> fix it. <laughs> how many times, men especially, how many times we start to work on something that's not really broke, but when we get through it, it's broke? Yeah. I've started off to do a $2 job, ended up cost me $40, you know, sometimes. <laughs> messing with something that don't need to be messed with and break something that you got to fix. I, I just, uh, so if, it's, if you got something that's working, 
it, 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 it's drawing dividends. It's, 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 it's good. Just leave it alone. Don't touch it. Don't mess with it. Don't mess with it. I tell people, don't mess with stuff. If you, you borrow anything, don't mess with it. If it don't work, just tell me it don't work. I guess something it does. Don't mess with it. So if you got something in the spiritual life that's working, you draw, it's drawing, uh, you're, you're seeing fruit, just, 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 just keep on doing it. Don't change it. Might fertilize a little bit, dig around a little bit, whatever. I've been, I've been uh, trying to prune trees up since January. Uh, we, we've made a great, great sacrifice and great uh, effort put forth, and it's, it's, it's just drawn, it's doing good. We, we got a lot done. But you know what? Every one of those limbs that I cut off died. I know I might have could have grafted them. I might have could have scraped them back and put some of this magic stuff on them, you know, and they rooted, and, and maybe not. I don't do too good on rooting stuff. I do better cutting it down. Most men do. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought about that when he's talking about the vine this morning and the branches, you know. Those branches within themselves just don't do any good whatsoever. I've got peach trees. i got peaches, you know, big as a silver dollar. You know what a silver dollar is. <laughs> <laughs> Times have changed. Now the Anthony B, you know. But anyway, uh, my wife took me out last night and showed how, how big they are. Because, see, spraying, you spray them when they first come out of the, the, the bloom and the husk falls off the, of the fruit, you spray them. Uh, don't spray it right before rain. You're wasting your time and your money. So, you, but anyway, and then about half growth, when those peaches get about halfway uh, ready to mature, you spray them again. And then about two weeks before you harvest them, before rain, you, you spray them again. And if you, I, I've, I've, last year, I didn't do too good at all. I, they, we had, we had a lot of pictures to start off with, but they just didn't, 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 didn't mature right. They, they rotted on the vine. They just, was, something wasn't right. Conditions have to be right for things to grow. Conditions have to be right in your life, in your spiritual life, if you're going to grow. A preacher from Scotland told me this one time. I've never forgot it. He says, Brother Pruitt, he says, I spent my entire life with that Scottish brogue, he would say, taking baby chicks and putting them under dead hens. He said, I, got, I get people saved and take them to a church and they die. So one, in 25 years of watching John, his, his family, and his wife, and uh, Church on the Word, in 25 years, I, I, I can tell you that the hen's alive. <laughs> no, no dead chicks. Now some of them chose to be a, a gallant wanderer on their own, you know, get, get out, leave the nest, leave the nest too early, and they get in trouble. And some of them don't have enough sense to come back from where they come from. When I, I left home, me and my daddy wasn't getting along too good. My daddy was bigger than I was, weighed about 300 pounds, and he was a man. He was a, a country, country sawmiller, uh, worked at a, uh, a ginning company for a lot of his years. Then, then he married into another uh, the family of Johnsons, and he learned how to make liquor. He become a bootlegger, uh, and he was a good one. I remember. I remember when I was real young, I was maybe six, seven years old. Uh, he would uh, get ready to go to the steel, and I w I couldn't tote a hundred pound bag of sugar, but he could put one on each shoulder, and then grab a, a hand a, a handful of, of cans. And in those days, we didn't put liquor in bottles; uh, we put them in cans. And then I could barely tote a sack of cans, and we'd walk off down the uh, uh, fields, down to the creek, or branch we call them, where the water was at, so he could make his steel. And one, one day he was showing me two he had put together there, and he says, well, son, one day all this will be yours. <laughs> <laughs> Like I really needed it. Well, my mama didn't like that. They were, they were 10 children. There were 10 of us, five boys and five girls. 
And uh, so she got in her mind that we were going to move out of the country into the big city of Austell. Uh, population probably 500 <laughs> or maybe 200. And somehow or another, she talked Daddy into doing that. She had a way of getting Daddy's attention, and sometimes he'd pay attention to her. And so he, he, he had a chance to get a job but down in Maple in at Furniture City or Sock Town. Anybody remember Sock Town? Uh, well, he got a job down there and, and, and quit the moonshining business. And we bought a house there in Austell. It's still in the family. My, my, my uh, uh, nephew owns it. Uh, no, I'm sorry, my brother owns it. Uh, and so he started work down there. I, I was working. I, I got a job by with him at night. He and I worked uh, together in a, in a glue part of the factory or the plant. I worked at one school in the daytime, worked there at night. Did that for several years. But he, uh, he, he, he totally changed his life. Uh, he still would sneak off and get drunk every once in a while. And, uh, but before he died, uh, he told me, he said, son, if I knew I was going to live this long, I took better care of myself. <laughs> and I've tried to remember that. Uh, I, 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 I abused my body when I was younger, but I've tried to, to, to be a, a temple of the Holy Ghost. I believe God wants you to take care of your body. Yes. You've got something that bothers you, leave it alone. Fort Morgan, my friend, I was telling you about. I don't know why I'm saying all this, but I, I, I need to listen to the Spirit of the Lord. And Fort Morgan, we feel, like I said, we fished together for, you know, for nearly 40 years. And I never could get him in church. I might have told this story to some of you before. I don't know if you hadn't, there's some people who hadn't heard it. Uh, he, he never would come to church. Every month he sent his tithe to the church that I went to. If it was the Lithic Christian Center, it's where he sent his tithe. If it was Brownwood Baptist Church, where I pastored for four years, he sent his tithe down there. And then sometimes he'd send his tithe to Living Awards Mission, a mission organization. Uh, but he just never would come. He went to Florida fishing, fished three or four days, and on Friday night he wasn't feeling too good, so he'd come home. I think it was on Saturday night. His wife heard him fall and hit the floor upstairs. So she went up and seen him passed out, called 911. He, he went to the hospital, had an aorta aneurysm. 98% of the, percent of the people die with that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about this was 20-something uh, years ago. And uh, they operated. Uh, doctor says success, he'll be okay. Pound of blood or so, so much blood, I forget exactly how much it was, but he says it's sealed off, it's all right, he's going to be okay. Well, he didn't wake up. Laid there for 32 days. Wow. Lost 70 pounds. He was skinny as you are. That's a compliment, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had no sense to pick up on that. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he lost weight. I mean, just, just skin and bone. Well, they called me 2 o'clock one morning. One of them phone calls you don't want to get. Well, Horace Stein, preacher, if you don't see him, they call me preacher. If you don't see me, you better come to Cobb General. I said, I'll be there in a little bit. Jumped up there and got in that Buick, headed towards Cobb General, started praying just to the Lord. Then I said, horse, I lost my buddy. I don't want to lose him. Thank you for touching him. And I said, uh, I would love to have one more time just to talk to him about his soul. Be sure, just, uh, Lord, are you going to make heaven your home? Don't hesitate to ask people if they're saved or not. Yeah. It's, good to, it's good for you to hear it, and it's good for them to say it. Yeah. Yes. Right. People need to say that I'm born again, I'm saved. Yes. Yes. If you ask somebody, you say, well, I hope so. No. You better start praying, that ain't good enough. Hope so ain't going to get you in. No. Hope so won't get you on first base. So l let them tell you that they're born again, they're saved. And, and I'm going down the road, going down the clay road, turn left in front of South Cobb High School. I know you know where that's yeah. at. Yeah, I just want to ride. You can't miss it. <laughs> Holy Ghost spoke. Man, in my lifetime, I'm 76 years old, and, my, and I've been saved, uh, you know, for a lot of years, 50 years close to it. And uh, I've heard the voice of the Lord literally that I could say it's the voice of the Lord, the Holy Ghost, speaking to me maybe a dozen times. I, I'm, I'm like you. He don't talk to me every, every two hours. 
call me up and see how I'm doing. I mean, he, he don't do that. I mean, some people just carry on an ongoing conversation with God 24 hours a day. Well, I, I wish I could. I just think he done that. That's the failure in my life. But anyway, I'm, I'm turning uh, up on Austell Road right in front of South Cobb High School. Holy Ghost said to me, he says, you're going to live, not die. Well, I could relate to that now. I know that scripture. Yeah, I thank you, Lord. I appreciate that. I'm thanking the Lord. Well, praise God. He's going to be all right. He said, uh, he's going to be delivered of cigarettes. The reason I preach against cigarettes a lot because God told me that he's going to deliver my friend, Hort Morgan, from cigarettes. Now, if they'd been good for him, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to deliver, I'm going to give him four packs a day instead of two packs a day. <laughs> now, he didn't do that. He said, he's going to deliver him, not smoke one pack. Now, that's enough room for me to say that's a doctrine that I can preach because it comes from the Lord. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's good for you to quit smoking. You don't know. Look at somebody and say, it's good for you to not smoke. Look at somebody and say, it's good for you to not smoke. Preacher says, it's good for you to not smoke. Look, look over and tell somebody, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay. I, I heard that. I said, man, Lord, I thank you. I was sitting behind his, that boat, him running a trolling motor. He light up at Winston. And about a pack later, I could eat one of them. You know, I mean, I, that smoke I always blew my way. I always blew my way. You know, I always blew, thank God I never, never, never smoked another one. But I sure didn't want to. I sure didn't want to. <laughs> he says, be delivered cigarettes. I said, man, praise God, that's wonderful. I ain't got to smoke. Breathe that smoke no more. I didn't know he was going to get his nephew to start coming with us, and he smoked. <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> But anyway, we went another 100 yards or so, and I, he said, and he's going to be in church with you. Now, that's three things that was very astronomical in faith and in believing, because these are, these are mountains, but I'm all I'm about, you're going to live. The 32 days hadn't spoke a word. Nobody just breathing on a breathing machine, a bed that turned him. I mean, no life whatsoever, shriveling up. The doctor said, everything's shutting down. His kidneys are shutting down. Uh, this ain't working. That ain't working. And everything, he ain't got long to live. Hmm. And then to be delivered of smoking, he'd been smoking since he was a teenager. And he's 70-something years old. And then going to be in church with me. Now, that's the biggie there. Hmm. I've never been to my church. I got, I got over, got my composure back where I could drive, and got on cop and went in to see him. He's laying there, no sign, no movement, just breathing machine, go. You know, just horrible, horrible. That, that's a horrible sight, horrible sight. They put me on support when I had my back surgery. I'm glad I was asleep. I couldn't handle that. I mean, I, that just, anyway, uh, I said, any change? She said, his wife said, no. The doctor said, it won't be long. And so all the family started talking about final arrangements. And I mean, they done had him buried, man. I'm spending his money. I mean, done <laughs> dividing up the fishing gear. I mean, uh, and, and I'm just sitting there listening. And, and somebody said something to me. And I said, well, folks, I, I said, I hate to tell you this, but uh, uh, the Lord spoke to me tonight and said, he's going to live and not die. Now, here's a guy that ain't living hardly laying there. And you're going to say he's going to live? What kind of, what you've been smoking? Right. <laughs> You know, but anyway, I told him, I said, and but when I said that, his wife jumped up, just like you stuck a knife, and she jumped up. She said, Preacher, I agree with you. The Lord ain't going to take my heart. Hallelujah. Two or three. Yeah. Yeah. If she hadn't have done that, it might have been, well, I don't know how to say that. I don't know how to say that. But anyway, it, it, it strengthened my faith. Anyway. Mm -hmm. So I said, I, I just don't see death. I'm sorry. I see life. The Lord says he's going to live, not die. And I said, uh, you know, we, we gonna, uh, it ain't over with. And she said her statement, and then, and everybody just kind of turned sheepish white, you know, and sat down and shut up. <laughs> it wasn't 20, 30 minutes. The nurse come in, or doctor, I can't remember. Maybe, I think it was a doctor come in. He said, I don't know what happened, but everything has turned around. He, 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 I don't know how long he'll live, but he ain't going to die right now. Oh, praise the Lord. I said, I'll see y'all later. Went on home. My wife's a nurse at Wellstar Cobb for 43 years. At that time, she's still working. She's been retired now seven years, and her job now is taking care of two 
perfect grandchildren. <laughs> I told my, I, I was in, uh, uh, in Oregon preaching a funeral and they had it telecast over the internet. I said, you know, I got a son that's not perfect and a daughter-in-law that's not perfect. And how they produced a perfect grandson, I do not know. <laughs> they heard it. Yeah. And he, a day or two later, after I got back, he says, was talking about his wife, he said, that unperfect wife that I've got. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she's, she, she goes by and checks on hold every day. 32 days been there now. No signs of change, just losing weight, bed turning, machine working, whatever. And uh, she opened the door and looked in. He's on the breathing machine, his eyes open, and he's seen her and he winked at her. Wow. She run and got on the telephone and said, guess what? I said, what? And she said, oh, it's going to be all right. He just winked at me. <laughs> sure enough, a little while, they, t they took the, the machine off. So when, when he, he wouldn't breathe before when they take the machine off. He wouldn't breathe. So they had to put it back on. So he took it off. He breathed good. I don't know how long they would send him to the rehab for a few days, a week or two, and had a birthday party when they sent him home. Sent him home on one day and had a birthday party the next, best I remember. And of course, we were invited to all of those get togethers. And so we went and had dinner. And I, I'm getting up and ready to leave because Sunday's coming and I like to prepare for Sunday services. Most preachers do. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I got up to leave, and Hoyt got up with a walker, or cane. I think he had a walker that day. He got up on that walker. Preacher, he said, he spoke quickly. Preacher, what time church tomorrow? I said, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock preaching, Sunday school at 10. He said, uh, the Lord help me, I'm going to be there with you tomorrow. Wow. He come in the door the next day. Two out of three. Man, it made me feel good. Yeah. I walked in and he 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 he, he said, well, Walker just barely could walk, but he was walking. Yeah. Come in, sat down, and greeted the people, and man, it, it really made my pastor, Brother Stubbs, he's gone on now to be with Hort in heaven <laughs> and the Lord. And he, he was glad to see him and we talked and so he went home. He come nearly every Sunday. Got involved with our men's fellowship, helped do the cooking, uh, working around the church, cutting grass, painting, just doing all kinds of things. When the doctor says if he lives, he'll be a vegetable, he won't know anybody, and he'll be full of medicine if he lives. I don't think he's going to live, he said. Well, he, he, he got well, took no medication. But about five years ago, they put him on a little blood thinner or pill. Wasn't much. That's the only thing he was taking. About two months after his healing, I was talking to his wife on the phone. I hadn't said nothing to him about smoking. I'd get around him, you know how Pentecostal people do. <laughs> I didn't smell a pack of cigarettes from that far from here to that back door. <laughs> I can walk by everybody in here and tell you who smokes, who don't. I mean, God, God just give me a nose for it. Like a bird, bird, bird dog nose, and I'm not. I don't mean to be mean about that, but it. it I buried enough of my friends over the, the last 40 years. I, I buried my brother-in-law, Frida's brother, uh, a little over a year ago. Esophagus cancer. He went to the doctor, and the doctor told him he had esophagus cancer. He quit smoking. Never smoked a nothing. Too late. Now, I've known people to do that, and God would heal them. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of them do that, and then they never went back to it. But why he didn't do that, I don't know. He just, he just uh, didn't chose not to do it, and he, he died a few months later from that. So I, I, I've got personal feelings about that. It's, it's hard. It's hard on the family. People tell me they love their family smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. I don't believe them. Because they're going to die and leave, leave that wife and those children for somebody else to raise. And uh, that, that ain't right. So uh, that, that's enough all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if it's broke, fix it. Mm -hmm. You've got a problem of sin, of habits, and things like that. I know a God and I serve a God that's quite capable and able yes, to deliver you yeah. from all these things. Yeah. When I was traveling with Brother Clendenin, 
Brother Copeland wasn't one of his favorite type people. I mean, he didn't talk against him, but he just he just didn't 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 just he was he said well he goes a little too far. Well, I, I did I picked up a little on that, but you know I listened to the guy. So several years later now has passed, and maybe about three years ago, uh, me, and, me and John were talking about him, and uh, I said, well you know I've never heard of a scandal about the guy. Look at the good he's done. Souls have been saved. Built churches all around the world. Give 50-something airplanes away. I said, you know, and I, I'm, I'm sure he's got a pretty nice house. He ought to have a pretty nice house. <laughs> you know, if I had, well, I, I came up when I say that. I started to say if I had a million dollars, well, I do have. <laughs> but what's what I say? So what I'm saying is you don't, you, you, you just be careful about casting stones, you know. Yeah. Especially anybody that lives in a glass house needs to watch what right. to throw. Yes. Hello, I had to preach. But anyway, anyway, I said, and I got thinking about it. I said, and I started listening to him on, on TV. I'd listen to the guy, you know. Never did really listen to him a lot, but I started listening to it. And and I, I wrote him a letter one day, and I said, you know what? Or I called. I don't remember exactly what I did. I said, I want to support your ministry a little bit. I think I started out. $25 a month or something. I don't know what it was. But I said, I want you to, and I said, apologize to Brother Copeland that I have used a lot of his material and never made a dime's offer, and I feel like a thief using his material and not help pay for it. I don't know whether that's bother anybody or not, but it doesn't me. I hate to use somebody else's stuff. Man, I'm a Christian. I, I used to love to do that before I was saved. But that new person in me don't want uh, to take advantage of anybody, especially stealing from them. I don't want to steal from nobody. Anyway, and so I started supporting him a little, little month. We, Fred and I, we, we, we started that. I moved it up, I think, to $50 a, a month now, you know. Never shook hands with him, never seen him in person, uh, but listened to him quite as often as I can. I uh, don't read a lot of his material, but I, I follow some of it. So that, I, I, I give my due diligence on that. <laughs> uh, I, we, we support people. I support people. Uh, I support my church. Woe be unto a man who's coming here and enjoy the air conditioner, the heat, man or woman, enjoy the McDonald's or the Chick fil A. My, son, my other grandsons would say Chick fil A. Yeah. Chick fil A. Uh, you don't go to Chick fil A, you don't go to McDonald's. I used to ask him that every, every night when the mother would pick him up. I said, Well, what you want tomorrow for a snack? You want Chick fil A or McDonald's? And he'd tell me, yeah. Well, McDonald's or Chick fil A, one day it'd be this, one day it'd be that. Sawyer, he said, Just feed me. He don't care. He'll eat anything. Sawyer, the two year olds back there, he, he, he just, he loved, it's just good kids. So, what I'm saying is, is you, you come in and enjoy someone else's uh, benefits and expenses and don't contribute to it, you same as a thief. I love every one of you. Yeah. I, and I know I'm not talking to y'all, I'm talking to somebody that's not here. Yeah. I know that. I know that. I know that. But pass it on to them if you see them before I do. <laughs> that, 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 you, that, they're, they're, that if they're not supporting the kingdom of God, they're like a thief. And that's what I told Brother Copeland. I said, I've used your material. And it's good material. And I said, uh, thank you for making it available. And I, I, you, I don't take it word for word, but sayings that he'll say, uh, he's a pretty sharp guy. Yeah, he yeah, he's a pretty sharp guy. Now, Brother Hayes, I never knew him. I never had the chance to follow him. So I, I don't know about him, you know. I know y'all say he's good, so I'll take you at your word. You know, no problem. I've seen the fruits of it through John. And so uh, it'll be a good work. So what I'm saying today is this. Stay the course. If the course is heading you in the right direction and you're seeing fruit, I, like I, I was telling you about my peach trees. I got peach trees, apple trees, pear trees, pecan trees, walnut trees. I got we got a lot of trees. I like trees. I love trees. Got dogwoods. I got uh, you know azaleas. We got my wife has done a real good job in planting. She loves to buy them. I used to love to plant them. Now she has to buy a man plan, <laughs> but, but, but we're getting it done. Uh, so, I, I, but I, one thing I, I know about that peach tree, I see it bloom. I prayed, I said, and my wife changed my prayer on that. I said, you know our peach tree? She said, those are the Lord's peaches. 
I said, Lord, those are your peaches. If you want to freeze them to death, you freeze them to death. <laughs> but I appreciate it if you let them live because I love the peach. I love your peach trees. So this year we prayed that prayer and had thirty, had twenty eight degree weather, and they they lived. <laughs> I don't know who it was saying this the other day. I heard it on TV. I don't know who it was. Uh, it might have been uh, uh, when Jerry Savelle. It might have been. Uh, I don't know who. Anyway, he he was uh, his mother and daddy had planted. A pecan tree. Well, from experience, it takes about 20 years for a pecan tree to produce pecans. Never just plant one. They need you need to have two or three of them. Anyway, uh, this pecan tree grew, 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 never produced no pecans. They're gonna cut it down. And uh, so this preacher was home, and they, they was telling him about it. Said, "Well, that tree don't never produce no pecans." He said, "That's the reason." What's that? Well, you're, saying, you're telling them not to produce no pecans. Never tell your kids you're not going to amount to anything. Right. Tell your kids you may be president someday. If you want to be. My daughter, when she was very young, she wanted to be a pilot. A uh, test pilot. That's okay. I thought that was a little far-fetched myself, but I, you know, I, well, who am I to tell her what she can do? I told her she couldn't date. She's 25. She's over 40 now, not even married. <laughs> I told her, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, she wanted to be a test pilot. I, you know what I did? I picked up the phone, called my friend, Colonel Bob Wilbur, my attorney now, who at that time was in, uh, uh, in the National Guard Reserve and uh, still doing work for the, for the Air Force. I said, I got a daughter who wants to be a uh, an airplane pilot. He says, she in high school? Yes, yeah, she's about to finish high school. He, she said, he said, she want to go to uh, Air Force Academy? I said, probably so. Well, yeah, I, I'd get that handled. <laughs> so, you know, one phone call. She, she wants to go to Air Force Academy? Fine. You want to be an airplane pilot? Fine. Then she they had her eyes checked, and they, they wouldn't let her in. I don't know whether she ever checked in to actually talk to the people or not, but the doctor or somebody says, your eyes out, you can't be a pilot because the eyes were too bad. Well, I, didn't, I should have just prayed the prayer of faith and the Lord healed her eyes, but I didn't really want to be an airplane pilot, <laughs> <laughs> test pilot especially. Right. I taught my kids this, and I shared it at lunch. Teach your kids to run around with successful people. Teach your kids, and you rub shoulders with the right people. Amen. If you live in a district, it's got a commissioner, a United States commissioner, uh, not a commissioner, but a representative, House of Representatives, or a senator, you need to know that guy. He don't have to know you, but you need to know him. You need to know how to get a hold of him. When he's going to have a meeting in your area, you come and support him. Send him a $100 offering, a, a donation every once in a while, and you'll get their attention. It's amazing how what a $100 bill yep. will do. Who was it borrowed the $100? You, you started this church with $100. You took out of the, your house payment. Well, see, I didn't know that. I could have given you that $100 back. I, I, I should have done that. You, you waited 25 years before you told me. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't ask, see, you didn't receive. <laughs> right. But you need to know your commissioners and county commissioners. <coughs> Don Alexander opened these doors of this church to people in our last big election, or year, or the election before this last one, uh, where we had county sheriff and we had a lot of people running for office. Uh, Mr. Barnhill and Sheriff uh, Pounds. Pounds, yeah. I have a hard time remembering his name. I don't know why. I don't rub the shoulders with him. I don't guess. Last time I seen him, I told him I'm going to come down and buy you dinner. He said, oh, no, preacher. I'm going to buy you your dinner. I, I got to go take him up on that. But yeah. You got an invitation to eat dinner with a sheriff, you better go. Yeah. That's rubbing shoulders with the right people. He's a black man, but I believe he's a Christian. I believe he's a godly man. Anyway, we, we, we had both of them guys here. They both spoke. We called them up here, and he and I and a bunch of other people laid our hands on him and prayed for them and prayed for their families. Yes, we did. Last time I seen pa Sheriff Pounds and, and the black guy won. Good man. Good man. Good sheriff. Doing a good job. He said, I remember that. Wow. I remember that. He said, I got a picture of that. He said, I remember that. He knew, he knew who I was then. Yes. 
At first, he, 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 I said, do you know a fellow by the name of Tim Pruitt? He said, yeah, I know Tim Pruitt. I said, that's my son. He said, it is. Well, it is. <laughs> Surprised. But anyway, uh, we, we laid hands on them guys right here. And one of them's a sheriff here, here in Douglas County today. And we can go walk in there. I guarantee you, Pastor John walk up there. I'm Pastor John. You remember me? He remember you. Rub shoulders with the right people. Know your politicians. Support them. But before you do all that, go, go register to vote and vote. That's the truth. If you don't vote, you're not registering, you don't vote. Or if you're registering and don't vote and you complain about the government, keep your mouth shut. That's the truth. You do not have a right to say anything. Hello? You still love me? Yeah. Let the pastor say amen. 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 All right. What I'm trying to say to you today, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you're on a course, if you're on a course, you're behind on everything that you owe. You got no credit. Who was you? Uh, somebody the other day called me. I don't know what it was. Couldn't borrow $20. So they called me. So he, he wanted to borrow $10. Well, I knew $10 wasn't enough. So I said, okay, I, I didn't tell him. I pulled out $20. I don't know why I even told my wife this or not. She learns a lot about me when I preach. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I pulled out $20, put it aside. And I, I went to get him. His car had broke down, and he had parked it in a daycare parking lot. Well, that's not a good thing to do. Stay away from schools. Stay away from parking lots. If you're going uh, daycare centers, if you're just parking a vehicle, because right. they don't know what it's there for. So don't do that. Call Pastor John. Tell him to come get you. Uh, or if he can't can get him, call me. That's right. Anyway, uh, then we'll both come. But anyway, he, he his car broke down, and he had to. He, he had towing service, but he didn't have the phone number with him. Well, to make a long story short, he said, I, I need, I need uh, for you to take me over to so-and-so road. And I had a court a date at uh, 1.30, Monday. That's another, another message. But anyway, I, I said, well, I've got to go to court. I can't, I can't miss that. That's too important. Uh, matter of fact, they'd lock me up if I'm not there. No, they wouldn't. But uh, anyway, I need to be there. I felt like I'd have been locked up if I'd missed it. But anyway, uh, I, I says, what do you need? He said, well, I need my, my car broke down over there, and I can't be, I have to be there for the towing service to come and unlock it and give them the keys. And he said, I, I ain't got no way to get over there. I, he said, and I ain't got no money for Uber. Greg has done left. Uh, he, he enjoyed that uh, Uber. He drives for Uber. Anyway, I go pick him up, take him somewhere. He opened the door. I said, hello, welcome to Uber. <laughs> yeah. Never got no money, though. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he, anyway, he said, I ain't got no money for Uber. He, I said, how much? He said, $10. I said, okay. I, let you, I said, I, I, I can't take you, but I'll get you $10. He said, well, the only problem with that, it's got to come out of my checking account, and we'll have to go make a bank deposit. Now, I ain't going to go to no bank and make no $10 bank deposit. <laughs> if I ain't got enough faith for a little bit more money than that, I just stay broke. I mean, that just, that's, I just, just, I mean, don't make a bank deposit for $10. Okay, all right, that's the best you can do. I'm just telling you how I feel. <clears throat> I said, okay, I'll take you to the bank. On the way to the bank, he said, you know, I got thinking. I get over there. He said, they take my car. He said, I got no way to get back home. I said, so you need $20. <laughs> he said, Lord done told me to put up $20. Yeah. So it said, well, no problem. I said, okay. So I, and he got out at the bank, made the deposit, called Uber from there, and I hadn't heard a word from him since. So he hadn't needed more money. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, People get themselves in a lot of trouble by not praying. Quit going to church because it has to work. We'll be into a man and woman that's got a job that don't have time to go to church. Yep. Now, now, find you another job. I pray you get fired so you become the church. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, there's, there's people out there that will put you to work that you don't have to work on Sunday. That's right. Hello? There are. There are. Look at somebody and say, you don't have to work on Sunday. <laughs> if you can't make, let me tell you this. 
Pruitt says this, if you can't make a living six days a week, you can't make a living. Right. You certainly can't make it on seven. Right. One more day ain't going to help you a bit. I can show you how to work five days a week and make that a good living. I can show you how to work four days a week and make a, all the money you want to make. If you work, if you be smart and you listen to me. Don't ask for advice if you're not willing to take it. That's willing to do it. And willing to do what's required of you. Now, this thing Christianity is not easy. I mean, there's some times that you've got to get up when you don't want to get up and go and do something that you don't want to go do. And sometimes there's things that's just required that you keep your mouth shut about. Sometimes you don't just, just, just read them a little riot act. Sometimes you don't slap somebody down. And, and, and I, I've, been, I've even got that mad it says I've been a Christian. I said, let me get a hold of that guy. <laughs> but God helped me, you know. Furniture store I had one time. A lady come in, bought a table and chairs. Okay. She come back a week later, but the chair run broke. I said, it just broke. I said, yeah, it's a ladder. You, somebody made a ladder out of it, standing up on it, and climbed up in the chair. I said, I've seen that a lot of times. Oh, no, anybody done that? I said, well, okay, no matter. I'll take it back to the factory. I'll take it back to the factory. Yeah, you got to give me a new it wasn't, a, it wasn't a problem of getting a chair fix. It was aggravation. Of, if they say it, well, I broke that run on that chair. I, I, I wouldn't have said a word. It wouldn't have bothered me. But they said they didn't do it. So that's why I hate a liar. Yeah. When people lie, I, I don't like that. There come some of my best friends right there. Me and that man right there met each other when I was 10 years old. We've been friends ever since. Larry and Jack Edwards, just give him a big hand today. Amen. Good to have him. Good to have you. All right, I, I, I'll, I'll quit talking about Larry and Jack now. But anyway, uh, you know, I said, I'll get you fixed. No problem. I'll get you nothing. So I took it back. And the guy says, oh, somebody's been stepping on the chair, hadn't they? Owner of the company. I said, yeah, I know. Anyway, he said, I gave him that. Don't worry about it. So I, I took it back to him and gave it to her. And her daddy come with me with her. That's okay. I ain't afraid. I ain't a man living I'm afraid of. Nobody. He said, well, I come with her. I just didn't want you taking advantage of her. Boom. <laughs> I mean, I started firing off. I mean, it's hitting on eight cylinders. I said, do what? He said, I just didn't want you to take advantage of my daughter. I said, I started, I said to myself, I said, well, you couldn't stop me if I wanted to. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to. You can stop me if you wanted to. I done balled up. I mean, I, it bowled up. That old, that old prut nature come out. Just for a minute, just for a minute. I had a guy working for me. It stood between me and him. And he said, Mr. Prut, I'm going to take care of your daughter. You I said, I don't want to hear that no more. I'm taking advantage of your daughter. I looked around. <laughs> this is my friend. Big guy. I looked around and said, don't say that no more. But I'd have come over him and because it just it, 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 like I was going to take advantage of yeah. that girl over twenty five dollar chair. <laughs> Why, Lordy day! I, 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 no, ain't no way. I'd give a tip more than that for somebody. And, 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 and but just just the accusation or the insinuation. If somebody said that about you, John, I'd want to ball him in the head. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that man better than that. He ain't going to do that. He going to take advantage of. You. <laughs> well, another part of my job was while with Brother Clinton, I was his bouncer. I was his bodyguard. I carried the money. I wasn't a Judas, but I carried the money. I had the money bag. And I set the meetings, and uh, I'd have to remind Brother Clinton, he's the greatest man in the world. I wasn't he a great preacher, great guy. Sorry, business man. He, I don't, he, I, anyway. That's why you were that's it. And he said that. He said he's a businessman. He handles all that. And I'd be there and I'm in charge of setting up his meetings and he would tell this guy he'll come and preach for him on a certain date. I said, hold it. He said, check it, Brother Pook. Am I, am I available at that time? Can I, can I do that? <laughs> I had to remind him that he gave that job to me. Don't be ashamed to remind somebody. You don't care if he is your boss, what your job is. That's right. Now, John, you're a pastor. You're not a janitor. You're not a janitor, you're a pastor. Amen. Preach that louder. <laughs> you're a pastor, Amen. not a janitor. 
he, Did you get that on tape? And he doesn't have to preach. Now, it's okay. <coughs> I'll fix somebody's toilet if I can. I, I'm not well, too he above just that. Too yesterday. And he'll do the same thing. I had to but it should not. Everybody's stuff either. We've hired something. I've got someone to do that. So. Thank you, brother. I knew I had that there. <laughs> See what? Good helpers, isn't it? Isn't good helpers just wonderful? It's just wonderful to have a good helper. But, you know, it's not that you're too good to do things. It's just some things. Yes. They said this about the first, when they set up the deacon board. They said, should we, leave, should we leave the table of the Lord or to leave, leave the study of the Word of God yes. and go wait on tables? Yes. That tells me I don't need to be waiting on tables. I need to be spending time in the Word. But if my wife is down, or if I'm home by myself, I'm not too good to cook my own clothes. I, I cook my own clothes. <laughs> cook my own food. I had, I had, the next thing that's coming out of my mouth is now doing laundry or something else. I ain't got that down yet, but uh, I, I'm still in training on that. I told, I told an, an engineer that I was working with one time, she hated coffee. She didn't like coffee. And I kidded her. Every morning I'd go in, I'd ask her, is the coffee made yet? And they'd, oh, it's just like, just like a clean fun. You wasn't, wasn't, wasn't bad about it. But anyway, uh, it got out to my supervisor with the state that I was uh, calling her a coffee maker. And I said, she don't even like coffee. <laughs> she, how can she make something? She don't even try to make coffee. <laughs> so I, I apologized to her, but I said, I apologize. I'll, I'll never use that terminology again. And I didn't. Now, I could have been asking her for a date, and it had been all right. <laughs> it never got, it got, never got no further. But no, no. Somebody heard me say, uh, is the coffee ready yet? You made the coffee yet? And she got, and then that made that other girl mad about it. Anyway, so be careful what you say, who you yeah. say it around. Yeah. But I've learned something. If you hang around that kind, right kind of people, you can have good, clean fun. Yeah. It's okay. You know, you don't have to be, watch every little word you say. You know, I, I've seen John now. I'm not saying a yay or nay. I'm just saying, making a statement, John. But I've seen you lay your hand on a lady downstairs a while ago. Just, just, just a friendly touch. I said, now a lot of places she, he'd done that in. If he's been state government to do that, he'd be reprimanded mm -hmm. for that. That's sexual harassment. Wow. What about that? Isn't that hard? I mean, just, just being friendly. You can't be friendly with people no more. People take it the wrong way. Want to take you to court yeah. over nothing. Yeah. But anyway, I could, that's another that's message for another time. All right, scripture. About time, man. How much time have I got? Okay. First Timothy. <laughs> I've got to pray for my eyes. Wasn't a greater preacher that ever penned any of the Bible than the Apostle Paul. Two thirds New Testament credited to him. We were kidding about going into a place to have a meeting in America, we go to look for a Holiday Inn or a, Metro, a Marriott or a real nice hotel. When Paul went to town, he'd ask where the jail was at because he knew he was going to end up there before it was over with. <laughs> We've come a long way, baby. <laughs> come a long way. In some parts of the world, you, we, don't, we don't have the favor that we've got. We still have it in America. We got some restrictions, but we're still pretty, pretty open. Uh, in Nicaragua, back years ago, before the Sandinistas taken over there, I had favor with uh, the, the president of the country. I was importing rockers uh, from Nicaragua to a furniture store, and I hired a guy to peddle them. He's peddling them out, settle them. Uh, handmade Nicaraguan mahogany rockers. Wow. I give fifty. Forty, forty-five dollars a piece for them. Sent them for a hundred. They were returned for hundred and fifty. Uh, it was good. It was good. I had a problem with a uh, with a, a manufacturer down there. They, they took my money, but they wouldn't make them in my chairs. So my brother happened to be uh, on the staff of Larry McDonald, Congressman of the Seventh District, House of Representatives. 
I called him about it. He said, let me talk to Larry about that. Well, Larry called me back, Congressman, said, what's the matter? He said, I know Samosa the real well. We, he went to West Point. He said, we're, we're, we're good friends. I said, well, man down there won't send me my shares. He said, well, I have a, a fellow by the name of Inez McKenzie to call you and you tell him what you need. I said, okay. About a day later, phone rang. Mr. Pruitt, yes. He said, this is Inez McKenzie. I am President Samosa's personal aide. Okay, he said, I understand you have a problem with some of our people. I said, yes, sir. I said, I bought some chairs, paid for them. He's supposed to ship them. I had a, a deal set up with Delta Airlines on 747. They were shipping my airplane back to here, to Atlanta, and I was picking them up. He said, what you want? He said, you want me seeing his head? I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, please don't that. I just want my chairs. He says, uh, I'll take care of it. I said, well, I'll be down there. He says, uh, he says when are you going to be there? I told him, he said, I, he said, I'll be there. He said, I'll pick you up at the airport. We'll have dinner and we'll talk about it. So I went down. Uh, sure enough, he, he, he met me. He was, uh, he was from England, but a real educated, smart fella. And uh, we went out. I didn't even know there's such a lobster house in Nicaragua. But he sent me to a fine lobster house. We had lobster. And I think he paid for it. I don't think he let me even pay for it. But anyway, uh, we talked about it and, and he says, uh, he said, my, my job is uh, public relations for the president. He said, we want to open up business uh, around the world, especially America. And he says, uh, you, you're helping with that. And he says, uh, we'll do anything we can to see that you get your merchandise. And so uh, I went out to see the guy. And the next day, and he apologized to me so much. And man, he 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 just almost bowed down, kissed my toe. I mean, just he he just so so humble. I know he got got a phone call <laughs> or a visit. But anyway, I didn't want to get into that. I'm not that type. I'm a peaceful guy, you know, just real real loving, real tender. Anyway, uh, my chairs came. I, I got on a plane, flew back, and my chairs came. So uh, again. Learn how to rub shoulders with the right kind of people. Know the right kind of people. Because that's a good contact. And I had a wonderful relationship there with that man until uh, the, the Sandinistas took over. And, uh, of course, they killed uh, Samosa. Uh, horrible death. They killed him. He was a, a truly lo loving American uh, that loved America. He, he wasn't American, but he loved America. He married an American a woman. And graduate of West Point, and a great ally. We should never let that happen. Wow. Thanks to Jimmy Carter, he died early. Thanks to Jimmy Carter, we lost uh, uh, Iran. The Shah of Iran was our good friend. We was buying all the eight dollars a barrel, and uh, the, one of the, the leaders of the country went over and told him it was too cheap. It needed to go to fifteen dollars. He come down with what well, he had. He, the Ayatollah run him off. We didn't do nothing about it. We lost an, uh, yeah. Panama Canal. Uh, I mean, I mean, just on and on. That's political. I don't mean to get into all that. But uh, learn how to rub shoulders with the right people. Know people of authority. Know your legislature. Know your sheriff by first name. They'll know you. Support them. Support your church first, but it's okay to support a, a politician. Don't believe a lot they say. But support them. <laughs> you, they can be your friends. I got friends that are liars. Now, I don't run around with them. I don't hang out with them, but we're still friends. Yeah. Be careful with who you hang out with. If you want to be a loser, hang out with losers. Write this down. If you want to be prosperous, hang out with prosperous people. Mm. I told you all the story, I think, one time before, but if I didn't, I'll hear it again. A man was wealthy. Very wealthy. He had a, a, a driver, drove his limousine, chauffeur, drove him where he wanted to go. Well, the chauffeur got old, been doing it for 30, 30 years, and ready to retire. So he told him, he said, boss, he said, I hate to tell you, but he said, I, I'm ready to retire. I want to enjoy life. He says, well, are, are you, are, are you, are, can you retire? He told him he's broke. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite wealthy. He said, you are? He said, how did you do that? He says, well, I appreciate the salary that you gave me. It was wonderful. And you did good. You were always good to me, boss. I ain't got no problem. 
But he said, I overheard some of your conversations. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, when you called your stockbroker and you told him to buy AT&T, buy 10,000 shares, I called my stockbroker and bought 100. He said, I've done that for 30 years. You've made me wealthy. Hang around with the right people. Uh-huh. Not when Hutton says something, when Jesus says something, right. or when Pruitt says something, listen to him. Yeah. <laughs> Pay attention to what's being said. And people miss million dollar opportunities, comes in one ear, goes out the other, and have not the foggiest idea that that was from God. Lord. Lord. I, I had that one time preaching about Christian schools. I had a burden for churches having Christian schools. And I had several friends across the United States and I kissed my wife goodbye and said bye to my kids and I'm heading up to St. Louis and I go from St. Louis uh, uh, go over to Arkansas and I'm at a preacher's church in Bentonville, Arkansas. Who knows what come out of Bentonville, Arkansas? Walmart. Walmart? What's that? I'm sitting at this preacher's table one, one morning after service that night and he said, Brother Pruitt, he says, you got $5,000? I said, oh, my God, he wants to borrow money off of me. <laughs> I failed to come in. <laughs> and he's quite wealthy man, I thought, and he was. Uh, and I says, well, I don't know. He said, well, can you borrow 5000 I said, well, yeah, I could. I couldn't lie to him. I could. And he said, um, well, I want you to buy some stock. He said, oh. Well, I said, what kind of stock? I'd had a little American General stock. I didn't have a lot. I had a little bit. And he says, uh, there's a company called Walmart. I'd never heard of it. First time I'd ever heard the word that I remembered, Walmart. He said, uh, the owner of that, Sam Walton, is a friend of mine. We went to school together, and we've been friends all of our life. He said, he's raising money for this new, new outreach, and he's going to have a Walmart in every big city in the United States and around the world. And he's going to sell American-made products at a good price. And, oh, this one on and on about it. I said, uh, uh, I thought it was a wall paper company, <laughs> Walmart. You know, that sounded like a good name for a wallpaper hanger. John used to hang wallpaper. He can relate to that. And, and, uh, and we come find out it was, a, it was Walmart like we know today. Well, John Walt had this on the drawing board. Uh, that's what he's going to build. Well, I didn't know that. And I, I was praying one time. I said, Lord, you know, you, uh, you blessed me and I thank you for it. But I said, uh, there's a biggie out there that I missed somehow or another. And I appreciate you show it to me and do it again. And he spoke to me. Well, what about Benville, Arkansas? Well, Walmart. I said, yeah, but Lord, I didn't know what Walmart was. <laughs> I didn't loan him the money. I didn't buy the stock. I should have. I could have. Just didn't do it. And if that stock today, if I'd have bought $5,000 worth, then it'd be worth several million dollars today. So what I'm trying to tell you is listen to what people tell you. I don't mean buy everything everybody out and knocks on the door and wants to sell you. I mean, that ain't what I'm saying. Use wisdom and the Lord will show you what you're supposed to do. I've lost some. Rockefeller got in the taxi cab one day. And the taxi cab driver said, you're Mr. Rockefeller. He said, yes, sir. He said, well, tell me something. He said, you've made a lot of good investments. He said, uh, how, how, do you make, how do you make so much money? He said, make good investments. He said, well, how do you know how to make good investments? He told the taxi cab driver one of the greatest truths that's ever been on the, the money market trail. He said, make a bad one. Make a bad mistake. I guarantee you, you remember and you won't do it again if you got any sense. Because it's broke. It ain't working. Don't do that no more. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Not a preach. Second Timothy. I know I said first Timothy, but it's second Timothy, because you was on first Timothy. Second Timothy. <clears throat> Verse number four. Let's read four, six, seven, and eight. He said, For now I am ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. It's a good thing to know when your time is up. Chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. Verse 6 says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. According to uh, Blue Bible, that's, that's what it says. I, I didn't turn it to in my Bible. 
Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Four and six, two. Four, six, four. Second Timothy or First Timothy? It would be better if I turn to Second Timothy. <laughs> I've done that too. <laughs> verse, verse 6, chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. Yes. For I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. It's a wonderful thing to, be, to know that your time is up. God told a preacher one time, or a, a king, Get your house in order because you're going to die. What a great revel What a great thing that is. Let him know things that he needs to do. He's got a short time to get it done. The Lord speaks that to you. Get busy about doing what you're supposed to do. Close those gaps. Say, forgive me to all those people you're supposed to forgive, and uh, they forgive you. And and do everything you can. Get that. Get that. Get that record right. Because you can't be ready to meet God if you got all in your heart, if you're mad at somebody. If somebody stole something from you and you're mad at them about it, you pout, you won't even speak to them, you fuss at them, you talk about them. Tells you you're not over. That's exactly right. If you're always talking about something, you still need to pray about it. Especially if you talk about it in the wrong kind of way. We had our car stolen a couple of years back. I reported it. About four days later, I got a, a ticket in the mail from Atlanta. My car. And they said me. Pass the school bus with a sign out. Wow. $500 fine or go to jail. Well, I picked up the phone, called them, said, well, I'm sorry you got the right car, but you got the wrong person. Well, you let somebody borrow it. I said, no, I didn't let them borrow it. They stole it. And I got a police report. I sent that in. They dismissed the charge. They called me last week, I think it was last week, last Wednesday, telling me that uh, we had, uh, they was going to be in court. They caught the guy. I said, well, that's the first I've heard about it. I'd like to know. It. Well, they wanted me to tell them how much it was and offer some proof and get restitution. I said, well, how can I? I don't know where my bills are on that. That's two years ago. I didn't give, give up on all that stuff. I said, y'all got a picture of him driving my car. Uh, that the school bus took, <laughs> and they sent me a copy, and I looked it up online. I said, y'all don't know who he is. Said, yeah, well, we got that, or whatever. Anyway, uh, I done got victory over that, and that, that, you know what that done? That brought it back to memory. Wow. And I got mad at the guy. I don't even know who he is. He may be a saved preacher by now. Maybe <laughs> preaching the gospel. I don't know. But I got mad at him again, all over again. I rebuked it. I had to get forgiveness again, all over. So when things bother you, it comes up and it bothers you. You need to pray about it. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's the preacher. But he says, he said, I'm not ready to be offered. Now he was offered, folks. You read the story of not only Paul, but the 12 apostles, the disciples of Christ. You read how they died. Only one of them died a natural death, Apostle John. They tried to boil him to death and oil wouldn't boil. God wasn't ready for him. But all, all the rest of them died by crucifixion. They filleted some of them. They skinned some of them alive. They hung them. They, 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 they threw them off of uh, high, high cliffs. They, they treated them people horrible. But they didn't, they preached the gospel to the man. They stayed the course, brother. It cost them their life, but they stayed the course. Yep. They stayed the course. I pray it don't happen to us, but uh, there's people dying today for the cause of Christ. Yep. A man will have his wife tied up out there, his children tied up. The man standing over him with a, with a machete or a sword, deny Christ or we're going to kill him. Thank God we don't have to go through that, but there's people that are going through that today. Yeah. I, got, I mean, I know we're supposed to have mercy on people like that, but you know, uh, people like that don't deserve to live that can do that. We were talking about abortion earlier this morning. Let's be real careful about abortion. We, 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 it's not the end of the world. It's not the un, 
for unpardonable sin, if it's happened to you, there's forgiveness for it, but recognize that it was wrong and get that under the blood. Yeah. I preached this at a Baptist church for four years. Don't you dare go before the Lord with, with unconfessed sin in your life. Right. You've done something wrong, you hadn't confessed it. I don't care what kind of security you believe in. Don't believe in everything's going to be all right. Just be safe. Pay it safe. Ask forgiveness for it. What will it cost you? You, you, you abuse somebody. You, you, you raped somebody. You, you, you stole something. Uh, and you hadn't uh, got forgiveness for it. You hadn't asked forgiveness for it. Well, let me tell you something. If you hadn't asked, you can't receive. If, it, if you hadn't asked for it, it's you're still on your charge. It hadn't been covered. Mm -hmm. Ask forgiveness. I know people preach this. My present sins, my past sins, and my future sins. Well, let's take it out of context. Don't you dare stand up there before God with sin in your life on Judgment Day, and you haven't even mentioned that to the Lord and asked forgiveness for it. Right. I told a man who believed in eternal security one day. There ain't nothing wrong with eternal security if you live like it. <laughs> ain't nothing wrong with that if you live like it. But don't live like a devil and talk to me. Call me at 2 o'clock in the morning drunk tell me, tell me how saved you are. I don't like that. I, don't, I think you need to get saved and you'll go to sleep. But anyway, he said, uh, what do you think about eternal security? He said, I don't think you can be lost after you're saved. I said, I hope you're right. He walked around with his mouth open. I never heard that before. I said, well, just suppose, though, that, I, that you're wrong. Suppose I'm wrong. What have I lost? But what if you're wrong? What have you lost? And what have you lost telling the people? And their blood is required of your hand because you lied to them. Mm -hmm. Brother Flynn doesn't know how to dream one time. This man in hell, going through hell, reaching down, picking up people, looking at them, throwing them down, cursing. Just went through a number of people. And the, the, the bird asked the Lord, Lord, what, what's he, who's he looking for? He said, he's looking for the preacher that lied to him. Brother, I'm telling you, that'd make you, that'd make you stay awake. <laughs> I'm telling you, looking for the preacher that lied to him. Will be in us if we say anything to these ears or anywhere we go that's not the truth. That's right. mm. I'm, I'm real careful about what I preach, mm -hmm. and I don't preach anything to you that I don't believe it. It's, it, if it, don't, it, it's not one size fits all. It's if it's wrong for you to do it, it's wrong for me to do it. If I tell you you don't need to smoke, I don't need to be smoking. Yeah. If I tell you it's wrong to drink, I don't need to be drinking. <laughs> if I tell you it's wrong for you to divorce your wife, I don't need to divorce my wife. Same judgment to everybody. Can't go wrong with that. No. Don't you wish you just, some of our judges in high courts today would use that same judgment? Ever think that they judge to the people? They're judging themselves? Yeah. Well, that's yeah. another, another, yeah. another message for another time. Okay. For I'm now ready to be offered, for the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my what? Course. course. Finished my course. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Man, them two things right there, you just do those, you get it made. Finish the course. Now, you can use, you can use this terminology, and course would be, uh, would be a goal. Finishing the course would be uh, uh, knowledge, something you want to attain. You want, you, want a, you want a degree in something. I haven't even thought about going back to school. Uh, I mean, uh, it's something you set your mind to do, and and you do it. Mm -hmm. So you're finishing a course. You don't you don't finish you don't finish a course if you start something and finish it. So I started law school, went to law school. I didn't graduate, didn't finish. So uh, I didn't finish my course. Now I, I, sometimes I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> but then sometimes I I I, I had the mind for it. The Lord gave me a, a mind for, for legal things. He gave me a mind for that. And I can remember court cases. I can remember things like that. But I just didn't, didn't, didn't finish the course. Uh, so the Lord will only, he, anything he calls you to do, he can, he'll give you the ability to do it. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been amazed at uh, the knowledge that the Lord has given. Here's old Plowboy from Pauling County. My brother, Plowboy from Pauling County, 
you know, on, on the, uh, the board, on the staff of a congressman. You know, it's not bad for two plowboys. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but God can do a lot of things with people. Yeah. It's amazing what, what uh, the Lord can do. Our, our son, we're real proud of him. I've told you all this before, but uh, Douglas County uh, started, wanted to start a drug court. And a judge told my son, my wife's son, my son, uh, Tim Pruitt, if you don't take the job I'm offering you, I'm going to send the grant money I've got back from the state. We won't have a drug court. He asked me, Dad, what should I do? I said, take it. I'll take it. I mean, it's just an improvement where you're at. You're not happy where you Well, he quit his job with the state. Uh, he was assistant uh, director out at uh, Larimore uh, PTC. Uh, well, not PTC now, but it was a youth detention center. And uh, he, he was doing good. He worked for the uh, parole board. He uh, was a parole officer, had, had 10 years vested with the state, and, and this job come up. With the, but he quit it. He was going to go to work, uh, working for himself, just taking care of real estate and managing real estate. And I said, well, you can do that on the side and uh, take the job too. I said, don't, don't. I've, I've always had two or three jobs, two or three sources of income. Never, never limit yourself. Be careful of doors that you shut behind you because there may be God opening them. And he stepped into something that's been very helpful to the drug addicts in Douglas County. Mm. The judge will have this man before him and says, uh, well, you got 20 years to serve, or if you go into our drug court program, uh, I'll, I'll let you go home right now. Nearly 100% say, I'll choose going home. <laughs> And they go through the program and get delivered. We got people. We got. We know people. Lots of people that are clean. One lady got went through the program, is clean, and now went back to school. She wants to be a counselor for the drug court people. Wow. And doors are opening up. Uh, I mean, there's numbers of people. You ought to go hear the testimonies of some of these people when they have their graduation. We have uh, governor staff, and we have senators and congressmen, and all these people come to here, and they, they're they're a test book case. Uh, of success Douglas County is. And I, I thank God that God has used my, my son, our son, wow. to be part of that. Amen. Be part of that. Uh, I'm, I'm in the airport. I keep going back to this, but I'm meeting the right kind of people. <laughs> I'm in the airport. I've been knowing Johnny Isaacson since the days when he was in the real estate business and insurance business. Uh, he's run for everything in the state, run for everything. Finally, uh, got elected to. Uh, House of Representatives. Uh, I think Chambliss, I forget who, which one, the United States Senator wasn't going to run, retired, and he was running for their seat. seat. And I'm at Atlanta Airport, I think my wife was with me, uh, Atlanta Airport walking down the corridor, and this body of people on my left passed us. Uh, it was Johnny Isaacson and his escort. And I hollered out. Hey, Mr. Isaacson, Senator Isaacson, how you doing? He was a congressman then. I called him a senator. He stopped, looked back, seen me, turned around, and walked back up there and shook my hand and talked to me. Well, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, well, I just seen you had a holiday. I'm glad you did. You done all right? You need anything? Everything okay? And them other people just sitting there scratching their head, who is this guy? Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm a friend of his. And we've been to conventions in Savannah, Columbus, all across Georgia, and been to rallies by the dozens. And uh, I, I could probably get a hold of them today if I had to. What do you say? Rub shoulders with the right people. No people. No people. You don't have to use that. Earl Lee, sheriff of Douglas County for 20 something years. I knew him from my teenage years when I was rebellious. He, he was working with us. Uh, at Buck Rutherford's coal and ice factory or, or store in Austell. I was probably 15, 16 years old. And he uh, come in, I had a had feeling kind of bad, had a hangover. And he said, uh, where you go to church? I said, I don't go to church. He said, you want to get saved, go to church. He said, hey, hey, Lord help you. Early. And people that know early. Yeah, I think that's wild. <laughs> That, that's wild. That's far out. They think I'm lying. But yeah. with my hand, as Wendy says, with my hand raised towards heaven, I'm telling you the truth. Uh, he, he said that to me, and I never forgot it. He ran for sheriff, got elected sheriff. I voted for him. Knew him real well. I'd see him once in a while. Come see me. Hey, you get here. 
In the 20 years that he was sheriff, I probably have called him three or four times needing a favor. Don't abuse it. Be careful how you spend your dimes yeah. on a phone call. Be real careful. Don't waste the phone call. I've had hundreds of people call me and say, you know early, don't you? I say, yeah. Can you do me a favor? You call him for me? I said, no. I don't abuse that friendship. And he honored that because he knew when I called him, he, I really needed him. Yeah. Had a real close friend. Real close. Got in trouble. I went to see him. I said, well, this boy, is, he's, he's guilty. But he, I said, there's circumstance you need to know about. I said, somebody stole some stuff and they got him to pawn it. He didn't have enough sense to realize they set him up. He pawned it. They found, the sheriff's office found it, locked him up because he pawned it. He said, he said, what's his name? I said, he said, yeah, I met him. Yeah, I know who he is. So he said, he don't know nothing about it. I said, no, sir. He, he, he'll help you find out who really. He said, let's go down to the jail. He got up his desk. We walked down to the jail, told the jailkeeper, get so-and-so out here. She's. Okay, we got him, brought him out there. He said, let me talk to him a little bit. He, he took him to the side, talked to him. Come back, told the jailer, says, uh, fix up a bond and let Mr. Pruitt sign it. Uh, $500, $500, $500, just uh, on a handshake deal and let him go. Get his stuff out and let uh, Mr. Sheets go. He says, Sheriff, I can't do that. Earl Gunn says, you want somebody else to do it? He was going to fire him right there on the spot. And the guy realized that he'd messed up. He said, oh, no, 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 you're the boss. You, that's what you want. That's what you'll get. He said, that's more like it. <laughs> I broke every rule in the book. And the sheriff broke every rule in the book. But he's a sheriff. He can break the rules. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but the, see, that, that, that only happened two or three times in 20-something years. I had 100 times I could have called him. And, 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 and what would have happened? Or we got to the point he wouldn't take my call. Because right. yeah. I'd abused the friendship. Don't abuse the friendship. Yes. This man needs to know what you're going through. But don't call him at 3 o'clock in the morning unless it's an extreme emergency. Exactly right. If it's waited till 3 o'clock and you knew about it at 6 o'clock at night, <laughs> wait till 7, 8, 9 o'clock the next morning before you call him. And never talk to him before church on Sunday morning or Wednesday Amen. night. Amen. Never bring up a personal problem if you can wait till after church. Amen. Now, if it's a life or death situation, that's different. But if he can wait, let it wait. That's what you call respect. Respect people's order. Respect their position in life. Now, I didn't vote for President Obama. But you know something? He was my president. If he'd walked through that door when he was president, come in here, I'd have greeted him as the president of the United States in the office that he holds. Yeah. Or I agree with him or not. You know, I, I, he, he'd have been welcome. He'd been friendly. I'd be friendly to him. I would respect him. I would not be disrespectful. Don't be re disrespectful for any official. You see, you see, you go in a cafe, you go in a restaurant. There's a military man in there. If you got the money, you can afford it. If you got a credit card, you can put it on. Buy his dinner. I used to. I worked at Marietta a lot up there, close to the Air Force Base, and there's a cafeteria that I like to go to, and there was always military people in there. And sometimes I just go up to the counter. I said, next five people up there put on my credit card. And I said, didn't say a word to nobody about it. They didn't know who done it. Didn't they need to know. I just thank them people for serving in the uh, military and, and firemen. I did the same thing. Policemen, I did the same thing. And just bless people. Yes. And respect them. Never, te never teach your kids. Listen to me. Never teach your kids and your grandkids I'll call the police to you if you don't behave. I'll make that police lock you up if you don't behave. Never tell your kids that. Never tell your kids, I'll get that doctor to give you a shot. Never tell them that. Right. You're, 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 what you're doing, you're setting up a barrier between them and you and that kid. Don't do it. Yeah. Teach them kids, he's your friend. Go up there and let's shake hands with him. I stopped a lot of policemen. In my time with kids, Tim and Eric and, I mean, Tim and pa Paula, I walk up to a policeman. I'd like to meet my son and my daughter. I said, son, this is your friend right here. This is your friend right here. Tim got a ticket one time. I probably told you this, but bear with me. 
back in his home driving a little El Camino I had him, still got it. It's going to be Walker's first car. It's his first car, so people have been wanting to buy it. They ain't nothing in the world to buy that car. But anyway, yeah. that's just beside the point. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, I do. <clears throat> got a ticket. Went to court. Started to call the calendar. Uh, I said, Your Honor, if you please court, I'd appreciate it if we could be the last one on the docket tonight. He said, do what? Judge. I said, do what? I said, I'd like for me and my son to be the last one on the docket tonight, if you don't mind. I said, he's contemplating law school. And I said, this is good training for him tonight. And I said, I want him to hear uh, all the good things you've got to say. Sit back, said. Looked over to the, uh, the lady that was doing the work. I ain't got a problem with that. If he wants to be, if he wants to wait, he can wait. I said, okay. She said, okay, that's all right. Put Mr. Pruitt on the last docket. <clears throat> we sat through the course of the case. They called my, uh, Tim's case up. And the, the, the policeman that gave Tim the ticket said, Your Honor, I'd like to reduce that to a, tri uh, to a uh, warning ticket, please, if I could. Tim and I had a suit on. We are dressed nice. I always dress apart. Yes. It's okay to overdress. It's never correct to underdress. Okay. Go apply for a job, dress good. Yeah. It's over, good, clean overalls, all you got, that's okay, wear them. But let them be clean and neat and be neat. That's another message for another time yeah. for people looking for a job. I'll tell you how to get a job. But anyway, uh, he, the court judge said, okay. And so finally got to our case. We, he, we went up. And I said, uh, Bob Wilbur sends his regard, Judge. Well, how's Bob doing? He, Bob had just, the wife had just got killed. She went to Kroger grocery store, pick up something to make a cake or something, and two, two men uh, kidnapped her, uh, killed her, stole her car, was going to New York or New Jersey or somewhere. And they, 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 they finally found him, uh, but they didn't find her for several days. They threw her out in Kentucky up on that long stretch of 75. And Bob was heartbroken over it. I, I counseled with her and was a good friend of the family, and we were good friends. He took it hard. Uh, they had some problems, but uh, they were working through it and uh, couldn't find her. They thought Bob had her done away with, you know. He had, yeah, he, he had, had some money. And uh, matter of fact, he turned out to be my banker. That's another, that's another message I got for you about finances is find a banker. Now, I don't mean First National. Find these people that's got bukus of money that's making 1%, 2% interest on their money, and they'd be glad to loan it to some good young entrepreneurs at 5 or 6%, and you could afford to do that. I was in business and made money and paid 18% on interest when Jimmy Carter was president yeah. and had to beg for diesel fuel. That's another story. Yeah. But anyway... Wow. Uh, uh, anyway, we couldn't find her. Didn't know where she was at. Car was gone. So we, me and my wife, we, got, we started talking about it. So what's the worst thing could ever happen? And we both agreed not be found. Worst thing could happen in Bob's life and the, the Wilbur family would be for Gloria's body not to be found. In other words, she's in, sold to some foreign agent. There's a lot of people stealing people, young girls. Be careful, don't go out there by yourself. Young, blonde-headed, blue-eyed boys, be careful, don't go by yourself. Don't go to Mexico by yourself. Don't go on the streets by yourself. So we prayed, Lord, let it be found. Well, the next day, I think it was, a family was going up 75 on this part of the road, and the boys had to use the bathroom. <laughs> You've traveled with five boys, four boys. You know what I'm talking about. Kids, you had kids. You and that, up there, it's 25 miles, nothing. Not even a service station, a road. Not even another road. 25 miles. Anyway, they, the dad found a place to pull off, and they went out there. And guess what they found? They found Gloria. So, God answered the prayer. Uh, it's amazing. Anyway, I told the judge, and he, he knew Bob had had problems losing his wife and wouldn't know how Bob was doing. I told him he's doing good. And so we got talking. And uh, uh, I don't know exactly how the case turned out, but I said, no, I'm going to Tim set through the course, court tonight just to see how court operates. I said, how many people's ever been 
Well, that's not a good question. I know teenagers. I had a bunch of teenagers. I like to ask them a question. How many of you been in a court case and sit there through a court case? It's interesting. But that's it to, to your teenagers next time you get them together. And, and, and make an appointment. Uh, call, call the bailiff or one of the judges or call Tim or somebody and, and set up a time for you to take some teenagers down to observe a court case. It could be traffic court. don't matter. Just the procedure. Of, it'll, it, it, it'll leave an impression in their life. Mm -hmm. And so we, we talked and he, I told him, you know, He's doing okay. He's going to be okay. And, of course, the, 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 the ticket had just been set on, uh, on uh, as a warning ticket. So there were no charges. And I told him, I said, well, Tim, I want Tim to set through this. Be, so he'd be able to just know how court works if he wants to be a lawyer. He'll know a little bit about it. And that, that made an impression. So learn people. Uh, rub shoulders with the right people. Uh, live the life. Stay the course. You got something... Uh, let it be first and foremost. And to Christian's life, there's not one thing we need to worry about. Can we please the Lord? Lord, what do you want me to do to please you? And you ask that question every day, and God will answer you, and he'll lead you, and he'll guide you in every decision of life that you make. Mm. Listen to the Lord. Let him lead you. Let him show you things. He'll show you things. I've been on a job. I work for... Department of Correction Engineer for, for a long time, and I'd run, I'd, I'd just, man, I was in over my head. I, I just stuff it, you know, I, you know, just, just electronics, and we, we got, we got guys, they said at Atlanta, and they sense the temperature in the prisons across the state. Inmates don't have a, a choice. They can't call them and tell them, turn it up, it's too hot, turn it up, it's too cold, or whatever. Uh, they, they do it with computers here in Atlanta. I, I worked with one of them. That was his job. He sets the, the temperature in the, in the work buildings, in the prisons, and, uh, manually. Johnson Controlled had developed an electronic situation where that could happen. That's commonplace now. If we can run drones out of California and Saudi Arabia, I mean, what is to turn the furnace on down in South Georgia? But, uh, but uh, they, they, uh, I, and I was in. I mean, God gave me a a point of position. I just, I just sometimes just have to get us out, go get away by myself as a Lord. Now, what is wrong with this? Show me what to do. And He would. He would. And I, I was in, was in, Costa, uh, not in Costa Rica. It was, uh, uh, well, anyway, down, down the Caribbean. <laughs> We've done it with Tim and uh, Freedom and myself, and I, I think Paul, I don't, Paul would go to coast. She didn't go, just Tim and I and uh, Freedom. Anyway, we we built a building and had a double opening out front. And I says, uh, well, I need some lentil block. They had, didn't have no idea what a lentil block was. Who knows what a lentil block is? One. Okay. I said, we need a lentil block. I said, they said, what, what is a lentil block? I said, well, it's a block that don't have no guts in it. It's just a U-shape. And I went and got the phone book, and guess what they had a picture of in the phone book? A lentil block. I mean, nobody knew what they were, but they put a picture of it in the phone book. And so what you do, you, you put a wood frame up there, and you stack that lentil block in there, and you put uh, some a little concrete, real strong concrete, a good, good, good uh, slump in it, and uh, lay some rebar in it and fill it full of concrete and let it set for about four days. And then you take the wood out and that lintel block will look like it's just pre hung, just hanging up right by itself. And people in that town would come by there and stand there and look at that for 30 minutes, <laughs> wanting to know how that block is staying up there. And they'd ask me, how in the world do y'all get that block to stay up there? Because it looks like just a regular cement block, but it's a lintel block. And, and I've used that on a lot of, a lot of different things. This, this project, you got, I'd, I'd go out and do it, and God, God showed me how to do it. But, and, and remember what I said about being picked out. I'm sitting in the airport in Guatemala, minding my own business. A pilot walked up to me. says, you going to America? Yes, sir. He says, I need a favor. 
I said, okay, be careful about that. That's a bad statement to make, but be careful. About it. But I want to know what it was. He says, I need, I need you to sit in my right seat. <laughs> he says, they will not let me take off in my airplane just to go to Miami where we're going. He said, without somebody in the right seat. And he says, I, I, you don't have to fly. You just sit there. Because the tower see two people sitting in the cockpit. I think it's 737. Or it might have been a DC-3. I don't know. It was a long time ago. And I said, yeah, I'd be glad to do that. And I was talking to a guy in the Guatemalan Air Force sitting right beside me. I said, you know, I'd love to do that. That'd be good to sort of tell my grandchildren and my son and daughter. I said, but uh, this guy's got a uniform on. He'd look a whole lot better if he's sitting in there. He said, you're right. He said, would you mind doing that? He said, no, no, I'd like to do that. I'd like to do that. <laughs> so I, I, I get back. But he come to me first. People are just, I, I, all my life they've done that. They just, I just be at the right place. I teach this to people. Listen to me. Be at the right place at the right time. Opportunity comes. It don't come if you're not there. That's right. You miss it. You miss opportunity again. You not, not, not ever know uh, who's going to be there, who you're going to rub shoulders with, or whatever. I had a sawmill in uh, the 70s in Douglasville, Georgia, up here, when Mr. Carter was president. Y'all can tell he was one of my favorite presidents. Uh, and, and they had rationed diesel fuel. Uh, well, what that means, you didn't get a, you couldn't just go out and buy diesel fuel. You had to get a, uh, get a, get a, 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 a it wasn't stamps, but it was a, an authorization to have so much diesel fuel a month. Well, I had applied for some diesel fuel and got this very little bit. They cut it and, and said there's a shortage, but there was no shortage. But anyway, uh, I'm out there working one day in my sawmill in an old Mercedes Benz car pull at black. And I never forget it. It looks just like it was yesterday. This elderly gentleman got out with a wool suit on and a vest, brown, brown suit and a brown vest. And um, come up to him and said, uh, you Mr. Pruitt? I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, he said I, got, I bought Clark Gable's old PT boat. And he said, it's deteriorated on the interior. And he says, I bought a bunch of beams out of Whittier Mill down in Atlanta, 100 year old, 100 year old beams, pine beams, 12 by 12s, 24 by 24, big beams. He says, and I need somebody to saw them for me. So I make some lumber. I just want rough stone. My, my carpenters down there can plane it and get it to where we can make handrails and do all the trim work on this boat. And uh, he said, I need you to saw some lumber for me. I kind of laughed. I said, well, you know, I said, it's a funny thing. I said, I can't even get these to feel hard to run my plant here to solve my regular lumber for my, my customers. I said, shortage on, can't get diesel fuel. Uh, I said, you know, it's just, I just don't know where I'm doing now. He says, are you trying to tell me that you, you're, you would solve my lumber if you had diesel fuel? I said, yes, sir, that's what I'm saying. If I had the diesel fuel, I'd saw the lumber. He laughed a little bit. He pulled, pulled me on the chest. He said, you know this little plant out here on Bankhead to the left across the railroad tracks, that, that little oil refinery yeah. down there? I said, used to be Cracker Asphalt? He said, yeah, it's kind of the same place there. He said, yeah. He said, I own that. <laughs> and I, he said, we make diesel fuel. <laughs> and he poked me in the chest. I still feel that. He said, if you'll saw my lumber, you'll never want for diesel fuel as long as you live. I said, when do you want me to start? <laughs> For, for months, I sent trucks over there with big 200-gallon fuel tanks, pulled up to the sink, tell them, fill it up. <laughs> this Simon name drove off. Never charged me a dime for diesel fuel, wow. as long as I needed diesel fuel. I mean, in Nicaragua, one of those chairs that I was having trouble with, uh, I, bought, I bought, I had a couple of extras. I took one home to, to my wife and... Uh, she, she she rocked our babies on, on, on and our grandkids on the rock, on that rocker, and I had another one. I put it together, and I cleaned it up real well, and I took it to Doc Young. His name was Doc Young, and I gave it to him. He said in his office, and he said, "You would not believe." Months later, years later, he said, "You would not believe the people that have asked me where I got that rocker." He said, and I tell him he, he come from a very good friend of mine, and he said they tried to buy it, and he said there ain't enough money in the world to buy that rocker. He's passed on, we're going to be the Lord. I went up there 
years later tried to find out if his family still owned uh, the plant, but I couldn't ever find out. But right place to right time, meeting the right people. And then and, and a man could get any amount of diesel fuel he wanted and no charge. Never paid a dime for it. My sawmill caught on fire one time, burned up all the electric. I had 400 amp service in there. That's high dollar stuff. I mean, just burned it up. And uh, I went on and told Doc. I said, Doc, I'm out of business. And he said, what's the matter? I said, well, something caught my electrical on fire, burned all my meters out and dis disconnects and all everything. He got on the phone, says, come in here. He called his plant maintenance man. He says, right over to Pruitt, see what's the matter with his sawmill. He said, burn up, something happened to the electrical. He says, what size is it? I says, 400. He says, I got a lot of 400 stuff here. He says, well, go out there and look at it. He went out there and made a list, what he, what he needed. That afternoon, he come pulling up over with a crew of men, changed every part of it out. Changed my band saw over, changed my saw, planer over to an electric motor. And I had an old diesel motor in one time, he'd he done away with that. And uh, didn't charge me a dime. Thousands of dollars worth of You get over two, 220 double off wire, you, you start spending some money. Oh, yeah. It was copper. We used copper back in those days. Anyway, stay the course. If it's working, look at the church. 25 years of doing things, it's, it's working. You're yeah. paying your bills. You're supporting missions. You're supporting missions. Yeah. Living Waters missions. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I had to say that. Yeah. John's on my board with Living Waters, and I got to have a meeting with you about something. Uh, but it's working. It's working. I think he's got enough wisdom of the Lord that God has imparted into him. If it wasn't working, he wouldn't be doing it. If it's working, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Stay the course. And when you got to modify something a little bit, modify something. Sometimes, sometimes you got to. I'll ask you a question. If you're a painter, how many houses can you paint by yourself? One. How many wallpaper jobs could you do at a time? One. What if you had five people working for you? You could do f and put one on each one, you could do five. Yeah. Same time, you could do five. That principle will work in church if you get the right people. These people, and I know you're doing this, you're training people, you're training leaders, you're training people. <laughs> but there, there'll be certain people that come along will be special. Yeah. They'll have a special anointing upon them. And as you recognize that, pull them aside, and you instill into them, and you pour into them what God has poured into you. Mm -hmm. you, you we could, like you said, lay hands on people. Hands that was laid on you by uh, different people. And now you're pay laying hands on other people. Yeah. And so you're, you're, you're keeping that calling alive, that ministry alive. How many times have you ever heard people say, well, my ministry is this? Incorrect. No bigger error made in ministry than, than my ministry. There's not but one ministry, and we're all doing the same thing. We do different aspects of it. Some people do evangelism one way. Some people do evangelism another way. Some people pastor church one way. And what works at Mount Perrin may not work at work, Church on the Word. Yeah, right. You've got to have enough sense to realize that. I don't care what John Hagee says. He's a good man, done a whole lot more than I ever have, preached to 20,000 people a week, but uh, the sale groups may not work in my church yeah. just because they worked in, in uh, San Antonio. Yeah. Strange thing, I toured San Antonio when I left the Air Force, when I went to the Air Force in San Antonio, and I never thought I'd, be, I'd go back there to a church, John Hagee's church, and, and, and listen to his ministry coming out of San Antonio. But, but we, we pass these anointings on to other people. Recognize that. Recognize that. Use that. When you've got people coming in this church, find something for them to do. Greeters is wonderful. Greeters, I know, I know people have been greeting for years. They, they think they died and went to heaven. They love it so much, know people of a first name, know all their kids. They've been doing it so long that their kids have got kids. 
You know, so it's a wonderful thing. People are called to do certain things, but it's the same ministry in our ministry of saving the lost yep. and making disciples. Yep. Yes. We must teach people things to do in the church, not let them sit down and rust to death. <laughs> Don't let them rust out. Just sitting, doing nothing. Put them to use. Keep them, keep them lubricated. Amen. Worst thing man do is retire and quit working. I'm looking for the day I can pay houses again, roof roof houses again. I'm, I'm not looking for the time that I'll be able to, uh, you know, to build another 15-story building. Yeah. Why not build churches in Peru? Amen. Why not? Yeah. It, it's a, it's a funny what's developed in Peru. We've got to be real careful of this in the church as well. But it's the same thing in Peru. The need comes up, and they don't have any money. They have got very little money. And they make a dollar a day, some of them. Maybe ten dollars a week if they're real blessed. Uh, if they got a way to get there. Most of the people live out in the village in the jungles. Uh, no way to go except a boat. If you ain't got a boat, you don't go nowhere. You can't swim. They'll, do, they'll make them a little dugout canoe and try to get across the river once in a while. And sometimes it's a mile wide. But anyway, uh, they'll, 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 they'll say we need this. We need this. No, we don't need this. And then I've been down there long enough. Me and my wife and Living Waters Missions. And they'll say this. Call Brother Pruitt. Call Brother Pastor Butch. They call me Pastor Butch. Call Pastor Butch. Last year, or year I think it was last year, Jorge called me. He said, Pastor Butch, have a little, he always says, I have a little problem. And my answer is, how much is it going to cost me? Because <laughs> <laughs> his problem, his little problems always end up costing us. Well, that's what I'm in the mission work for. Y'all send money, other people send money to me. I'm sitting on the front porch the other day and a, a friend come up and brought me $500. Well, I needed 15, but I got five of it. Praise the Lord. You know, I, 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 that'll go in the bank and I send him a, a, a draft. And the, his bank will call him at eight, 8 o'clock at night and say, you have got money from Living Waters. He said, I knew it was from Living Waters because I called Pastor Butch. But anyway, he, he says this. Uh, he, I got a little problem. He says, I, I tried to get to, uh, get this uh, get this uh, washing machine, uh, but I, I could not get it. Uh, it's uh, I don't think it's five hundred dollars. I think that's what it was, or it might have been eight hundred dollars. I don't know. Anyway, then he says, uh, when I try and I can't I can't do it. He says, uh, Lord, don't send me the money. He said, uh, Lord lays Pastor Bush on my heart. He says, Pastor Bush has never let me down. Oh boy. <laughs> How can you say no to that? Yeah. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a grandkid. That's, Pop, Pop, give me this. How can you say no? I said, okay, how much? Okay, well, $800. I said, well, well, we'll pray about it and see how it comes. Money comes in, okay. Money come in, I sent it to him. Now, he was happy, but you won't hear somebody that was rejoicing was his wife having a washing machine that works. Now, a washing machine to them is not like to us. He's got a house that he can probably sleep uh, 20 people in. And there's always people in the jungle coming to stay with him. And there's always missionaries coming through there. And they all have laundry. They don't have a dryer. They hang it up on a clothesline in the foyer out, out in the, the patio area. They just don't have a roof on it. Sun comes down and they hang their clothes up. They can't hang them outside. People steal them. And so they dry them there. They don't ask for a dryer. They ask for a washing machine. And they'll wash, they ain't no telling how many loads of clothes a day. And there's always wash laying on the clothesline when I go there. And they ask me every day, you have, you have, you have laundry, Pastor Bush? Don't take it to the laundry, man. We do it. They'll, they'll iron my shirts, button them up like they're brand new coming in out of a package. Fold everything the right way. Handkerchiefs folded and ironed. Everything ironed, creased and pants. Just, just immaculate job. Of, of doing it, because we 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 tip them good, and we we give them blah blah, you know that. But it's such a blessing not to have to go. To, you have to get a three wheel cart to drive five miles to leave your laundry. Then you got to go back tomorrow to get pick it up, yeah. and that's that's aggravating, you know, especially to Americans. They they don't think nothing about it. The three wheelers that make a living hauling you back and forth love it, because they they get three three solos, you know, that's about a dollar. To make a trip uh, to to town and back, but they, they make yourself available. There's another thing. When something needs to be done, find time to do it. 
Uh, you may not be able to paint a door. You may not be able to paint stripes on the, the drive parking lot like some people do. You may not be able to do that, but I promise you, I talked to you long enough, I know something you can do. Yeah. One of my jobs when I was state, I'd interview uh, inmates and uh, find out. First, first thing you do with an inmate, you know where they can do anything, and I find out where they live. If they live downtown Atlanta, forget it. They can't know. They, they, they can't find their way home all the time. I mean, <laughs> they got no tools. They, the pawn shop's got everything they've ever had. And they're not going to, they're not going to, they just can't do nothing. Find somebody that lives in the suburbs or out in the country, and you'll find somebody that can fix things. You know, as a builder, an electrician, or a plumber, or something. First thing, yes. So, the same, same way with church work. Uh, same, same way with winning souls. I'm going to teach you how to win souls right quick, and I'm going to close. I don't have 15 scriptures, but I'm going to close. <laughs> Preachers say the funniest things sometimes. Don't they? I mean, they don't plan it. They just, they just open my mouth and it just comes out. It's amazing. It's amazing. I must not. Be, I must not need to say that. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> teach, teach me how to win a soul. Yeah, teach, that's what it was. Yeah, how to, how to win a soul. Don't go up, knock on the door, and say, "Are you saved?" It, it might work every once in a while. You tell, I, know, I heard of an insurance man. I, I sold insurance most of my life. And um, one guy knocked on the door. They come to the door. He, he start to leave. He said, you don't want to buy no insurance, do you? He made convention every year doing that. People say, well, yeah, but as a matter of fact, I have a stock. We've got a grandbaby. We need to get insured. Or we, I need some more insurance. He, they, the, the customer would have to stop him. He's leaving Oh, no, wait a minute. Let me talk to you. Now, if another guy, he looked for signs that said, no trespassing. He said, now, the reason I knocked on your door is that sign said, no trespassing. That told me that you hadn't had the opportunity to talk to the right insurance man. Because <laughs> he, 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 he read that sign and believed it. He said, now, I don't think that you would mind me really helping you with your insurance. <laughs> We have a, a, a service that's free. It's, it's a policy review service. I sit down, go with your insurance, be sure your beneficiaries are right, who your insurance is with. Uh, do you have all your policies? Or, or, or have you paid them lately? Or, or are they, are they lapsed? Or if you have, let's go through what that you paid on and lapsed. Do, they may be, still be value in them. You may not know that. And just go through uh, all kinds of things. It's amazing. Knocked on business guy one day. He lived here in Lithia Springs. He had a 10 cent a week accident policy. That's what the premium was. Had it for years. And Larry laughed about this. He used to sell well, the same company. Remember old accident policies were dime a week and they converted them to monthly, 80 cents a month. Man, they done that last got fired because they lost a third a month, uh, a third of a month's premium every quarter. A lot of people think there's four weeks in a month. No, there's four and a third week in a month. You figure it out. Anyway, a lot of people, uh, Jews will pay people on the 1st and 15th. Right. Honest people will pay people every two weeks or every week. If you get paid on 1st and 15th, you're losing a month a year. So you got a choice. There. People sometimes they ask you, you got to get paid weekly or you want to do it every, every, every two, uh, 1st and 15th, they'll say. You say, well, 1st and 15th, all right. Well, you lost a month's work, uh, wages a year. And that adds up to a lot of money. Anyway, that's another, another horse with the cut. Anyway, he, uh, we come there to collect his insurance, and I noticed his hand was withered. He said, yeah, I had a stroke. I can't move my hand. I said, let me, see, let me see my book. I got the agents to look up the book. Sure enough, he had an accident policy. I said, well, you got a 10-cent accident policy that will pay you $500, $1,000, I'm sorry, $1,000 for that hand that's withered. He said, no, Miss Pretty, he said, that's the accident policy. I've already talked to people about that. I said, well, you talk to the wrong people. I said, you talk to somebody that knows what he's talking about. You take that policy and you read it. It says $1,000 will be paid for each member, uh, hands or feet, that you lose the use of from any cause. You can't get around that. It don't say accident. It says any cause. That could be sickness or accident. 
And I said, fill out this form here. Okay. I gave the form. He took the doctor cut, filled out, gave it to me. We sent it in. Oh, about a week and a half later, he got the check for $1,000. Now, I got his attention. Know what you're talking about. Whatever business you get in, be good at that business. Mm, yeah. And know something about it. And believe in it. Hey, certain things I can't sell because I don't believe in it. And there's things I can sell that I make big money, good money in it, but I, don't, I, I can't do it. I, to do the, 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 the gimmicks the way they want you to do it, I can't do it. I have to believe in everything that I sell. I own a lot of life insurance today. 77-year-old man pays a lot of money for life insurance. I do that because I believe in it. Yeah. Don't owe that much money, but I promised my wife when I married her 53 years ago, if anything happened to me, she wouldn't have to uh, peddle hamburgers in McDonald's mm -hmm. to make a living. Mm -hmm. One man told me one time I offered my insurance policy. He said, uh, well, I ain't going to leave my old lady no money. So all she do is some man take it from her. I said, well, that may be the case. But I said, I'll tell you what. You leave her enough money, she can afford to be choosy to raise your kids. Mm -hmm. And she can be choosy to manage that she has to help raise your kids. You want to get mad at first? It doesn't matter to me. We'll go back if you want to. But, but it's the truth. Yeah. Later on, he said, where did I sign? <laughs> you got to think about it. If you, if you leave that money, wife enough money to be choosy. And don't, 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 don't. And I'm not selling no policies today. I still got my insurance license. I can still sell it. But I believe in it. I believe in it. Nothing, no, I've never delivered a check to a widow or a check to a husband and they want to give it back and say, it's too much. Never. 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 So, anyway, fight a good fight, kept the faith. It goes on a little further and it's adding more to that. It says, there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me. Oh, but it don't stop there. It goes on and says, and whosoever. Now, I, I preach this. Whosoever is me and you. That's everybody. Yeah. Whosoever. John 3, 16. Yes. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever. believeth in me shall have everlasting life. Hallelujah. That's me and you. Yes. That's everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Look at somebody and say, all come to repentance. All. That sorry brother, that sorry sister you got, that sorry mother, that sorry daddy, that sorry kid you got, they don't have to be that way. It's God's will for them to be saved. Don't give up on them. Just like my friend Hoyt Morgan, uh, 30 years I preached to him, talked to him, talked to him about the law, about being in church, and God honored that. I've witnessed to people for, for years and years and years. Wake up one day, they are in church. It finally took root. He says, cast your bread upon the water, and it will not come back void. Something, now what he's saying, something will, take, something will take a hold of it. It'll feed somebody. It'll feed somebody. And they, it could go on and on and on and on, and ain't nothing worse than a long-winded preacher. <laughs> this has been good for me. It only has been for y'all, but, but I appreciate you. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your truth of your word. Thank you, Lord, for the most edited word in the Bible or a book in the world is your holy Bible. And thank you, Lord, that you have seen fit to give it to us. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for your promises. Thank you, Lord, for all good things that come to your people, Lord. You've been good to us, Lord, and we praise you for it. Thank you for healing all of our bodies. Thank you for saving all of our loved ones. Thank you for healing us all in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for making us all very prosperous. Yes, sir. Lord, you've got good things for your people. Yes. And I pray, Lord, this week that good things will come to the people to come to Church on the Word. Thank you for those 10 souls being saved. Yes, sir. Lord, if there's one here today that knows you not as Lord and Savior, Lord, let them, let it be known and we will pray with them and they can receive you as Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. So be it. Say this with me. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you, Lord, for saving, Thank you, Lord, for saving people. Thank you, Lord, for saving people. Thank you for saving my family. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Be blessed. Amen.